Did it work? It did. <laughs> How did this happen? Is it my Instagram, apparently? I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. That's not good. All right. Well, we're going to get started here. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Leeds Edutainment uh, podcast with my man, Hal Capone, um, brought to you by Chubby Chickpea. I'm going to type this in real quick. Are you? Am, am, can you pin my comments since we're doing this backwards? Um, how, how do I pin them? I don't even know how to pin them. You just got to click on my comment and then hit pin. Like hit on it. Even though it should say <laughs> leads and there you go. So yeah. All right. Now we're we're okay. I guess Hal's got the uh the the super deluxe version of Instagram. I, I don't have I don't know. He's big I guess he's been doing more podcasts than me, so they gave him a free upgrade. Hey, I just got out of jail, actually. Uh, they banned me for a month on my live, so uh this is like my third day free right now. How what did they kick what did you say? What did you do? Uh, I didn't do anything on my live. I posted a anti-racist post like about eight months ago of uh, a black guy hanging a Ku Klux Klan clown in a tree. And they, 10 months later, they cut my live for a month because uh, I guess it's against guidelines to be, you know, not down with the racist. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, what the fuck? Like, so, we're going to get to more into that because that's always, that's a big issue when we're going to talk about. Well, they just brought that much to my mind. But uh, for people that don't know you, you know, me and you go way back. I'm trying to think when I first met you. I, I want to say I met you on the basketball court. Uh, the rec. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. So for people who don't know, Hal and me, you know, Hal Capone is a hip-hop enthusiast. He's uh, – hardcore enthusiast he's been in the music scene he's older than me so he's been in around it longer than me and he's a diehard for all you fans out there that think you're fans or you are fans Hal might be a little bit of a bigger fan in these areas because <laughs> I can tell you this man is dedicated to the cultures and he participates 110 percent he has his own podcast what's the name of the podcast uh chopping it up hardcore with Hal Capone Chopping it up hardcore with Al Capone. And how many episodes? Uh, my next one will be number 74. 74. So even you doing this inspired me that I should do one too because you were doing such a good job with it. And, um, and it's been working out. So head not, head, salute to you. But for those that don't know, me and you are from the same little town called Sandown, New Hampshire. If you know where that is, you probably... <laughs> You're probably from there or from around there because most people don't know where it is. Are you born or raised there? No, no. I was uh, born in Haverhill um, ah. and lived in Haverhill and Plasto like until I was maybe 13. And then uh, I kind of migrated up to Sandown. So you're like me. I, I was lived in Georgetown, Mass, right next to Haverhill, Groveland, and then migrated to Sandown, New Hampshire at 12 or 13. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> um, weird. That's what people did back then, and I've said it before. Is like you know, um, people in Massachusetts moved to Southern New Hampshire because it was cheaper. The houses were cheaper. Yeah, basically all it was. Yeah, people wanted a cheaper house and more. Uh, check mark from schizophrenic says my grandparents had a camp in Sandown. I wonder if they were on. Were they on Phillips Pond, Angle Pond? They probably were. They, or he's joking. Upset. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I mean Haverhill. To sand down, that's a big jump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Did you get along right away? Did you get? Did you find your bearings in Southern New Hampshire? Because I didn't. Did you uh, uh, mingle well? Yeah, I, I did pretty good. I mean, like I said, I, I lived in Haverhill maybe six or seven years, and then I started going to Pollard School, and then right when you know in elementary school you kind of make friends fast and, and then i grew up with all the plasto kids and then you know once middle school hit uh, you know i got along with those kids too and and i was a plasto kid that turned into a sand down kid so everything kind of went pretty pretty good for me yeah for, for those who don't know we went to a school called timberlane which is a regional school plasto sand down atkinson in danville Four other towns you probably three other towns you probably haven't heard of much from the area, but um, we all get thrown in the same 
same high school together. And uh, Sambo- Sandown Boys, which we became, uh, had a stigma. <laughs> it was a stigma. Like, it was kind of like, because Sandown had a town hall, a, a convenience, one convenience store at the time. Yeah. And a fire department slash police station and then a uh, post office and, and later a macroburn factory. And that's all it had. Other than that, it was dirt bikes, bikes. Oh, you know, it was a Methodist church with a basketball hoop, which I'm sure you played a lot of time on. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, that was it. You know, and the convenience store was known for it was a dirt bike, four wheeler stop off. There was trails all around it. And and you were about a half an hour from the school that you had to go to. So it was out, it was, it was in the woods, basically yep. in the woods. And the people from there, if you kind of like, if you lived in Sandown, Plastown, the other towns would be like, yeah, fucking Sandown, Danville, blah. <laughs> you know, and it was, uh, you had to fight that. Yeah. So it was, uh, but did you, you, so you got along right away then, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, like I said, I was, I was kind of a, like a, a street kid in Haverhill and Plasto. So like I knew everybody because um, I didn't have much parental supervision when I was younger. So I was a young kid that was hanging out with 16 year olds. And so I knew all the, you know, the troublemakers and I knew all the jocks and I knew like I just knew everybody because I was always like hanging out like in the streets in Plasto and Haverhill all the time. So it kind of, everybody just knew who I was. And then when, you know, I got older, I just, I don't know, just by luck, I kind of knew everybody by just hanging out, you know? Yeah. It took me a while, man. Like I, I walked in in seventh grade, man, and people weren't, you know, I was the big guy and all those sand down roughnecks, man. Like they just, <laughs> they wanted to fight me yeah. and take me on. Cause I was the new big guy, man. And yeah. Uh, I just left a school of fighting all the time. So I was trying to not fight. Yeah. And, um, but man, <laughs> you know, sand down produced some friggin' some tough SOBs. So did Plast out too. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, rest in peace, Clint Senna. But that dude caused a lot of fucking problems in my life early on. <laughs> Do you remember him? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. That crew, that crew is what I had to deal with. And um, yeah. They weren't, they just wanted to fight the big, you know, those guys. It was a school where people, those, before everybody drops out, it was just wanted to fight. And that's how you got your rep was fighting. So it was like, you know, being the big guy, target on my back. Being the new big guy, even bigger yeah. target. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I survived that luckily. Uh, but, ba- you know, basketball is actually what brought me around, you know, and that's what got me connected with everyone. I was playing basketball. I was like recruited by <laughs> AAU, not AAU, was uh, intramural league because I was tall and they were yeah. like, they needed a tall guy. So I played. But that, I, I remember me and you on the basketball court because you were pretty good. You got good at basketball. Yeah, yeah. I, I got good. At, you know, what's the funny thing is, though, I got good at basketball after I got out of high school. I sucked during when I was in ah. high school. I, uh, I started playing street ball and then I started joining men's leagues like Holy Angels Men's League. Yeah. And, the Hampstead gym had a men's league too. And then any street ball that was happening that we would like, you know, I would play anywhere around that area. So um, that's how I got good. I just, a lot of playing. And then I honestly just up my game from playing in the streets and playing in men's leagues with older guys that were, you know, being rough and stuff like that. You had a good handle. Me and Parker were talking about the other day. You had, good, you had a good handle. You could dribble really well from what I remember. Yeah. I, I like to drive to the the basket all the time, so I wasn't much, like I can shoot, but like I'd rather drive to the basket. I'm not that tall either, so it's uh, yeah. I just remember you had good moves, but um, I also remember the first time I think we kicked it outside of there. We were at Johnny O'Neill's house, and I think the police broke it up, from what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and we both got PC that night, even though I think you were above PC age, but I think they might have just looped us all in together. <laughs> I don't know if you do remember that. I I don't know if I got PC'd, though. I think they might have let me go. Oh, they do. Uh, yeah. Because uh, I remember you being there. We were there, and uh, I, got, yeah. I had to get – I got taken out. Yeah. <laughs> but you uh, – Let me actually go, because I don't know if I was uh, – I don't know if I was, like, drinking at the time or, or you know, doing whatever. I, I think I was – sure you were drinking. Back then I was – I was trying to hang around with girls, so it was like I was trying to stay as straight as I could back then, you know? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So when did the music come into play? Um, what? But hip hop or or what like, came first, hip hop or hardcore? I'm guessing hardcore. Yeah, hardcore came first, definitely. Um, I went to a hardcore show when I was 11 years old in 1983. Wow. Uh, what show was that? Uh, that was SSD, DYS, and the Angry Samoans at the Channel in Boston. Um, one of my friends was 16 at the time and was like, oh, do you want to go to this punk like show or whatever? And obviously, like I was saying, I didn't have much parental supervision at all. So I was out and about, didn't really, you know, my mom didn't really care where I was at at that time. So um, I was like, sure. And I saw the energy and I kind of had longer hair back then kind of scared you know what I mean because everybody had shorter hair at the time and um I was pretty scared of it the energy but like it kind of intrigued me to look into it more so uh I waited until 87 to start really going to hardcore shows and then it was like full bore going to the channel every Saturday and Sunday when they had uh Saturday and Sunday matinees hardcore matinees and then I started going to the rat in Kenmore Square um you know, Paradise, all, all those clubs. Like, and this is in the 80s? Yeah, this is like... Hold on, I'm going to turn the light on. I'm listening now. Yeah, this was like uh, 87 to like 90. And then, you know, 90, I just kept going. Like, I had been to, you know, a ton of shows. That's crazy, because, you know, when I think of the 80s, I think of, um, I think of rock music, like yeah. heavy metal, glam bands the beginning of hip-hop i don't think of hardcore that i mean i think of punk rock but i don't think of hardcore to me hardcore i started noticing about in the 90s but you're yeah. saying that you're going to shows in the early 80s hardcore was a thing back then yeah definitely definitely wow boston had like straightly under it must have been strictly underground then well, I don't think, like like I said, the channel, the channel packed it in. That, that was a big club back then. And every hardcore show that I went to back then was packed. Like, there wasn't, like, 50 kids there. There was hundreds of kids there. Um, so it was quite a quite a decent scene even back then. You know what I mean? What were the big hardcore bands in the 80s? Um. Well, after af after I saw SSD, they kind of like uh, disbanded, which is like one of the biggest Boston hardcore bands that ever was, uh, Straight Edge Band. Um, and then Slapshot was a huge, huge Slapshot hardcore Slapshot was in the 80s? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I know Slapshot. That's a legendary yep. hardcore band. I didn't know it was that early. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I saw Mighty Mighty Boston's at the channel like six times when nobody knew who they were. They played there all yep. the time. Um, Wrecking Crew. I don't know if you've ever heard them, but they yeah, were. Wrecking Crew. Yeah. Um, there was, uh, you know, uh, what was that band? Uh, Eye for an Eye uh, was a big band back then. It 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 was really like a lot of New York bands came to Boston too. You know, like Agnostic Front and Sick of It All, and and um, I'm trying to think who I saw. Gorilla Biscuits, Youth of Today, all those bigger bands in the '80s all went to Boston and had huge, huge shows. So. Um, and, and the lineups were always packed. It wasn't like yeah. a few shitty bands and then like two headliners. It was like a, a packed lineup head to toe, you know? Yeah. I mean, for those who don't know the channel, the channel was a legendary, it's a legendary Boston club that was doing everything he said and then everything else. It was one of the, you know, just a very legendary, I think it was in, I want to say it was in South Boston, though, like right on the line there in the seaport. Was it there? I it was right next to the you you know where the Neko building used to be the stone Neko building and then yeah, yeah. the river and then across there was like the post office uh, the yeah, huge so it's near South Station it's near South Station yeah right and that was like I think it held like a thousand plus people I'm not sure but that was the bit the the, the famous club where everybody kind of started that was the big one that was the big one and I think they did some hip hop there in the eighties too. Yeah, Karis One is saying, uh, Checkmark saying Karis One got robbed at the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Checkmark is full of useful information. Apparently, he's gone fishing in sand down and, you know, gone to the rat in the channel. The rat, too. Obviously, the rat <clears throat> played a big role, in, obviously, with hardcore shows, I would imagine, too, in Boston. Yeah. Right? Huge, huge. The rat yeah. was huge for shows. Oh, as Kane said, Sam Blackchurch. Of course, I forgot. I, how can I forget about Sam? Church. See, that's that the that's the first local band 
I think I heard of that was hardcore was Sam Black Church. And the only reason I knew that was because I'm a little, you know, I'm younger than you. Um, because they would play the the uh, the weed the weed fest uh, the unit what do they call the weed the weed fest in Boston the freedom rally. Uh, freedom rally yeah. yeah yeah they were the one they were like the the token Boston hardcore band Sam Fly Church but that was in the nineties they were already yeah. around in the eighties yep yep definitely and Tree would always also play that Tree. that band <laughs> I know the lead singer the lead singer is quite the character Dave <laughs> Dave something yeah I call him, I call him Dave Tree. <laughs> yeah tree and sand black church that's if, if you had asked me in the 90s you know any hard boston hardcore bands i would have said those too yeah definitely so in this midst of hardcore when does the hip-hop come when does when do you get exposed to hip-hop and how and why did you like it being a hardcore fan um two different things yeah this which is funny though because i think they're synonymous with each other just because of like the messages that they you know underground hip hop is kind of uh DIY just like hardcore is they're talking about like you know similar issues of like what's going on in the cities and stuff like that and, and like so a lot of people that always say oh i hate hardcore i don't like hip hop they're very similar in the messages that they're putting out you know what i mean so um I feel like that was kind of a, a reason why it, it hooked me. And I have a funny story of how it really hooked me. Um, first time, I, you know, I was experimenting with drugs when I was a teenager. I, I, well, we don't talk about drugs on here. It's, it's, it's I think I, maybe four, I took paper acid for the first time. And uh, this kid had the first Run DMC tape, Run DMC, Run DMC. And uh, we took it at his friend's house and we listened to that tape maybe 200 times, just nonstop for 10 hours straight, just the same thing over and over and over again. What's and the first one? The ver the ver and after that, that was like my first, you know, experience with hip hop, really. I was hooked after that. And I, I don't I don't think it's the acid that really kind of did it. It was just I didn't have the exposure at the time. I think that was like 1980 five yeah run the mc is like i think first out of 83 actually yeah i might be wrong till 85 so then i started diving into like the first fat boys albums and like curtis blow and cool mo d and all that older stuff uh you know utfo um anything i could get my hands on i started buying up so uh, now were you like in sandown and plast out i mean the 80s you're are you are you still in haverhill uh, no, no, I was in Haverhill till about uh, like 79. So, so in Sandown and Plaza, are you like one of the few people listening to hip hop at that point? Because I mean, <laughs> I can't imagine there was a tongue, you know? What yeah, I mean? yeah, even with hardcore too, I think there was only like maybe three kids that listen to hardcore and maybe five kids that listen to hip hop back then. Right, right. Because, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's not a, it's not an area that's exposed to this type of culture. No, for the most part. Yeah, every you know, this is inner city culture. It's no in you're in the woods. Yeah, every, <laughs> everything was like Aerosmith and like Kiss, yeah. Ozzy, and and shit like that. So, and, and it's because you were exposed to it because you were driving to these sh or getting rides or taking the bus to these shows. I'm imagining. Yeah, that's not rides from like uh the funny thing is like you said there wasn't kids that liked this kind of music um you know where we were living so i went out to other towns there was it's funny kingston new hampshire was a huge town that i became friends with a lot of kids and and that's like where i started getting rides from all the time because i didn't even have my license at the time and uh these kids from kingston would drive me every every show like every time so shout out sanborn <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sandboard High. <laughs> so, um, so you're driving to Boston. So let's talk about some of these hardcore shows. For those who don't know, and I've worked, I've been to hardcore shows. I've worked to many hardcore shows at the Middle East as a manager. It's intense. Okay, and I'm not talking intense like moshing a little bit. I'm talking about fights, stabbings, razor blades. All types of stuff, <laughs> especially back then, it was a lot more dangerous. Let's talk about some of the danger involved and what would happen. And talk to me about some of your experiences. I know you've had some crazy experiences getting jumped and all this other stuff. Talk to, tell yeah. me some good stories. 
Yeah, I mean, the rat was usually the the most roughest. I saw a lot of, like, fights at the channel and stuff like that. But, like, the rat was probably the most roughest and, and toughest. Uh, a lot of fights out in the parking lot. Uh, a lot of people getting jumped. Um, like, shows ending because of just melee of fights going on. Um, I My first, like, one of my first ones that I saw at the rat was uh, – the accused played this band from Seattle with this straight edge band called brotherhood. And, uh, there was like a bunch of fights and like, I almost got hit in the head with like a bottle and there was maybe six fights all going around all over the place and they shut the show down. So I was like, Oh, this place is fucking crazy. You know what I mean? So I kept going and like, it was you, like, I kind of stayed out of that shit. Like, I was, uh, like, up front and in the pit and stuff like that. But I kind of knew not to fuck around too much. But uh, there was one show that I went to. Uh, it was Coming Correct, uh, 454 Big Block. Um, I forget who else had played. And that was at the Rat. And I was in the pit. And somebody, I was going back in to the crowd. And somebody kicked me in the small of my back. So, like, really hard, like a cheap shot. So I did a spin kick and hit the kid in the face. And the next thing I knew, like, usually that's just, like, you know, <laughs> the mosh pit. You, you get hit, and then you go back, whatever. So I turn around, and the kid's running at me, trying to punch me in the face. So I duck. He gets me in a headlock. He tries to smash my head into the stone columns where the rat had all these big stone columns. So he yeah. tried to smash my head into that. I kicked. I had my head down, kicked off the pole. I mean, the the stone column, and then uh, 30, no, it was maybe not 30. It was probably like 15 to like 17 FSU guys just jumped me, and, and I think I got punched like a thousand times, got kicked, uh, broke one of my ribs, split my head open back here. Um, like, I had a huge bruise on my temple. Um, the bouncer was afraid to pull me out of there. All my friends didn't, were scared shitless to even jump in. Uh, I just tucked down. I didn't want to go to the ground because uh, I know they would have stomped me in the head. So I, I s stuck my elbows in my crotch area, covered my face, just took a beating. And uh, finally, after a while, the the bouncer kind of pulled me out of there, which he was afraid. I, I turned around. I didn't even know what was fucking happening. I turned around covered in blood. I turn around. I see a million people screaming at me. I didn't even know what the fuck happened. You know what I mean? I think I hit one of those guys cousins or something and that's wh how it started and then you know it was the wrong place at the wrong time but i don't i don't feel any animosity towards that that's like the that's the lay of the land there you know what i mean it's Absolutely. like i was I, that didn't deter me from going there i wasn't afraid to go there it was just like i hit the the kid gave me a cheap shot and i hit the wrong kid at the wrong time and that's that's what it was i like what am i supposed to say you know it was did a you shitty stay at the, did you stay at the show or did you leave? no no <laughs> the the guy that brought me upstairs, I was, I mean, I was pouring blood. I couldn't even see. My whole face was covered in blood. I had blood all down here. And uh, I'm like, oh, my friends drove me. That they're out there. And the guy's like, they'll fucking murder you and throw you in the dumpster. They're waiting outside for you. He set, sent me down like a side like exit. And I got on the tee covered in blood, pouring blood. And uh, nobody would sit next to me. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about FSU. Uh, FSU obviously has a very <laughs> good and bad stigma uh, in the hardcore scene. Depends on who you talk to. Um, but yeah, I mean, their presence in the hardcore scene really scared a lot of people away. And uh, did you ever deal with these guys on another level other than getting jumped by them? And what, what's their, what's the significance these days? And um, I don't I don't even really even know what the significance is these days. I kind of go to like more uh, different type of heavy music uh, shows now. Yeah. But uh, back then, like I was friends with them because I was one of the youngest kids at the channel. So it was like they were always cool to me. And back then when they first started, um, they were trying to beat up Nazis. There was like Nazi yeah. skinheads that were going to shows that, and they were just like trying to beat, beat them up and get them out of the scene totally. Um, so everybody thought those guys were jocks too, the way they dressed and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So I, I want to I talk about, just stop you right there with the Nazi skinhead thing. Cause I remember that's still prevalent to this day. I'll still see bands say shit like that, racism, skinhead. Hardcore had a very big stigma of having 
racist, let's just say it, white racist, bald guys, shaved heads, skinheads. And some people think that's what hardcore is. I, I'd like you to clarify the difference between that and what the actual hardcore scene is, because I know that there is a, very, a lot of bands that speak up heavily, heavily against racism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think, like I said, I think it's a misconception too of like, there's definitely racist there and it was more prevalent in the early days. There still is, but um, then there was like skinheads that were like sharp skinheads, which were like, um, you know, skinheads against racial prejudice, which those those were the like real hardcore guys that were like trying to put a positive message on things and right. kind of getting like, you know, shooing the racists out of the scene uh, by violence or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of people that don't know the hardcore scene would say, oh, yeah, like hardcore is a bunch of racist kids, like a bunch of white racist kids. Um, but, I mean, in I've been in hardcore for, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I was 11 30 years. Yeah, four, yeah, 35 years, 40 I just, years. So... Um, I've been in it for a long time and, and I didn't see too much of it. Um, maybe earlier on in like the early eighties, uh, it was more of what it was, but, um, I didn't really see too much of it, honestly. And I, I think it just gets a bad rap. Um, maybe in other cities it's worse, but Boston was pretty, you know, it was, it was bad in the early eighties, but as time went on, I don't think it was as crazy as everybody thinks it was. And I think it was from what I remember, certain bands brought out a certain this, this, these racist like there were bands that were, were more prevalent to bring out these these racist types it wasn't all bands it was just certain bands when i was in it you'd be yeah. like you want to stay away from this band because this brings in this element this band's not so bad yeah. is that kind of how it fell in the line um yeah kind of i mean i think like a lot of bands get uh you know racist uh you know people that liked hardcore would like a band like judge which they thought had had this like anti-racist message but in actuality judge was like totally against racism and they had a lot of shit going on in their tour when they went on tour with to deal with all these you know yeah that was with the big guy the big front man right heavy front man yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i seen them actually at the middle east like probably like five years ago and he was saying like he was calling out all the racists he's like yeah fuck the racist. yeah yeah Explain to me the appeal for those, you know, I got a lot of hip hop heads on there and probably like hardcore on the guitars screaming. Explain to me, I know what the appeal is, but explain the appeal to me in hardcore. Like, um, why do you like it? I mean, I, I think I was attracted to it by the energy of it. Right. You know, like anybody that listens to it, you might be like, all right, I don't like it, but go to a live show and then right. tell me. It'll, all right. Because the energy, um, you know, I was like a, a an angry teenage kid, and I got a lot of my no. frustration out. <laughs> no, <laughs> I got a lot of my frustration out in the in the pit, you know, back then, yep. and it, it helped me a lot. Instead of like getting in fights outside in, in school and stuff like that, it's like I could get my energy out. I could hang out with my friends. Um, it was it was kind of like a brotherhood of friends that like looked out for each other, especially in New Hampshire when New Hampshire was popping with hardcore up in Rochester, New Hampshire, and Manchester. I mean, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. All of my <laughs> friends are like we were just like one big crew that had fun and hung out and like looked out for each other, and and um, it was just it wasn't like a gang or anything. It was just kids that liked to dance hard and 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 then go out and have a drink afterwards, or like I was straight edge for like five years too so um i kind of was you know uh i wasn't into that thing for a little while but uh you know that, that's I mean, it's straight edge i mean i'm obviously i'm a sober guy for 12 years because i you know i have a problem with drugs and alcohol but the straight edge movement why, how did that even come about because it wasn't necessarily about fighting addiction it was just like yo drugs or alcohol is whack like how did that even happen because at such a young age to get kids to be sober at that. And as a teenager, that's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I, I don't know what, uh, like, I don't know what's what the you, motive behind that. I think the motive, <laughs> like, like all these kids were like drinking and smoking weed and doing drugs and stuff like that. And I think it originated by, you know, kids that didn't want to necessarily do that. But so they almost went, the completely opposite direction and was like, all right, straight edge is more punk than, than drinking and doing drugs. Like we're, we're going right. again. 
the norm here. So we're actually the punk, more punk kids by bringing this message across and like it, it, it hit like a fever, you know what I mean? Like yeah. people just caught on to it and it, and it exploded. And uh, it, it, you know, it caught me when I was a young kid too. I, I, I got yeah. caught up and it, it's, it's such a positive message for young kids too, um, that kind of have a shitty life like I did when I was a kid. Um, yeah. so I think it's a good thing. I think it exploded though, like I said, by being like more punk and not hanging out with like the hoods that are drinking and like smoking, right. you know, smashing bottles against, you know, buildings yeah. and doing stupid shit. You know what I mean? I think it was more of a po positive. It's like message. drinking and drugging was mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. Was, and yeah, and sobriety, uh, straight edge was more the anti. Yep. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. That's it. it I'm, I'm just amazed that so many kids and people that young caught on to it. I knew a friend, shout out Emo Beta. He was straight edge for like freaking 30 years. And, um, you know, he had the tattoos, the straight edge tattoos and all that stuff. And like, yeah. he took that shit. He yeah. wasn't even really that big of a heart. He was more of a hip hop guy, but he was part of the straight edge movement. Mm. Yeah. I, uh, um, two years for me now, I haven't had a drink. So uh, I'm, I'm like on, back on the, uh, I, I mean, I don't like the label at anything anyways. Yeah. Water. <laughs> you joined in the fucking H2O club here or what? Yes. <laughs> last, last two years. And plus, well, like, last, last 12 for me. Yeah, um, weed, weed and that stuff for me, I haven't smoked in, I don't even know how long, 18 years, 17, 18 years. So, like, I've, I've yeah. pretty much straight for a while now. Yeah, I always told people hardcore was like, because I always used to worry about it when I was managing the Middle East and doing shows. We always worry about fights and, you know, in the pit. Like, we can't let people get, it's like, you, like, don't let people get in the pit. It's like, you can't have a show without the pit. Like, it's yeah. going to happen. It's yeah. inevitable. So, you yeah. got to let, you know, we have to let it happen. And then, you know, and what's crazy about the Middle East downstairs is it's low ceiling. So, and you can easily, the guys easily jump on the stage and then stage dive into the yeah. fucking crowd. That's yeah. where it gets a little scary because it, it, liability wise, if someone jump yeah. in the crowd and break their neck and that's happened at the Middle East and there's been big lawsuits of people like that. Yeah. But it's so hard. Just, you can't stop it. You cannot stop yeah. it. Because no you can't put a barricade in the Middle East downstairs. And the bands love it. They just love doing just jumping on stage for the yeah. play, jumping right out into the yeah. crowd. And like, and, and if you had never been to a hardcore show, it's about participation of everybody that's there. It's not about the guy. Yeah, the guy's screaming. He's getting his anger out, but he's throwing the mic in the guy in the crowd front to hit in the you know he's throwing the mic in the guy in the crowd right in the front to him to scream and the other guy to scream and everybody to jump on the stage and get it. It's this whole thing. Yeah. It's not a, uh, you don't just look at it from like just the band performing. It's everyone that's there and the energy that's there. And it's, you know, it can be scary at first, but once you understand it, it's actually pretty, pretty dope. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's another thing I was going to say, like what, what the allure was for me too, is like, I could stand right next to the guitar player. I right. could like hug the singer while he's singing. And like, there was no, separation between crowd and, and band yep. some set up right in the middle of the floor and just yep. play and that that's what attracted it was more of a, a family type thing uh and i was like whoa i can like actually touch touch these guys and jump off his back and do whatever you know what i mean it yeah. was it was a very different thing for me and at the time i i i needed something like that and um it helped me a lot i guess yeah, I absolutely and that you know, like I said, you're older than me, but but by the '90s, when I'm in high school and I'm like diving into hip hop and I'm like into it heavy, it was like in my my grade, in my in my grade, it was you were either really a diehard hip hop head or you were a hardcore kid. Hmm. You know, shout out Howley, Flanagan, you know, Burgey, all these other dudes, rest in peace, Burge, um, Peter Mar, was it Johnny Mar, Peter Mar, both of them, I don't even remember. Yep. Um, in the same kind of Pete played, but Johnny Johnny was up. Scott Rudd. Um, these guys were all pushing the hard. They, they were in hardcore bands and going to shows and doing that whole thing. And you know that was that was, they were into it. I mean, they were playing in bands. We weren't playing in bands, you know. Yeah. And um, but that's what it was. It was like the people in the music, and then obviously there was the alternative groups. Shout out Josh Day and Primus and <laughs> you know, all of them. But um, but that was that was the big thing, you know. But we all liked each other's music for the most part you know yeah. it wasn't like 
or your shit's whack. Like we might not have understood the hardcore like those dudes, but they definitely the hardcore dudes definitely understood hip hop. Yeah, and just like you did, you know, and um, they definitely had tons of respect for it. So that was like, and then you guys throw you guys are all throwing shows at like the Sandown Church and like all these other like local spots, VFWs. I mean, you guys were di freaking why before it was even a term, you know what I mean? And uh, that was always impressive to me. I was like, I wish I had gotten into music earlier, playing or doing something at that age, yeah. because. It, you know, you guys are doing it. You know, yeah. let's talk about the spread of it within the spread within the, the DIY community in New Hampshire because it took it was it was big. Yeah, I mean, it, it exploded. Like, um, I'm trying I'm trying to think like exactly what year. So that was like maybe mid to late nineties. Um, yeah, it was it was exploding around here. Actually, I mean, the Atkinson uh, Community Center had shows. <laughs> yeah, the the town hall had a bunch of legendary shows. Um, yeah. Sat- the Ookla the Mock uh, show at Sad Cafe was just complete mayhem. That was like they they didn't let any hardcore bands play after after that show it was fucking complete mayhem there. Who was in Ookla the Mock? Uh, Adam, Matt, yep, Adam. Dulong. That was Dulong's first band. Yep, yep. yep Matt, okay. um, and and all the other kids were from like Kingston. Uh, Pete was in that band too. Pete, Pete Mar. So Dulong, when I first met Dulong, was like a straight hip hop head, straight oh, hip hop. Dressed yeah. the whole the whole nines was hip hop yeah. before like you know ninety one, ninety two, and then all of a sudden he was like hardcore front man. <laughs> it yeah. was like yo, and then Kanai, his other band, Kanai, right? Pronounce that right? Yeah, yeah. Kanai became when I started booking shows in the Middle East. I would tell people, yeah, I went to school with a guy from Kanai, and they'd be oh, word, uh, like Kanai was yeah, they, they well got- revered in the community. Yeah, they got big, definitely. Adam's always been a hip hop fan. His his brother, always. his older brother, older I guess. Yeah. yeah, Ron, like he was huge hip hop head. So those those guys definitely loved hip hop. Like the dreads, right? Like yeah. The dreads, uh, they were on my bus. Shout out my bus. Those guys were on. Uh, I don't think I don't know if Ron was on there, but Adam was on there, and his younger brother was on there. What was his younger brother's name? Uh, Mark. Mark, yeah, Mark was on. Yeah. Tough sons of bitches. Yeah, those. <laughs> Tough sons of bitches. But yeah, I mean, I think about that era. It just what arrived from it in the 90s and hardcore and hip hop. And then, you know, it, it was just, it, it was just a different, it was just a much rougher era ever. You know what I mean? Like it was just like, just a rugged and rugged and raw era, man. You know? Yeah. 90s were amazing for hip hop though. That's like where I really got my like love yeah. for like the golden era of hip hop is yeah. the night by far for me. Um, that that hooked me. I still listen to. <laughs> if you say like what hip hop you listening to, it's like mostly '90s stuff. Still, I obviously I branch out and I listen to newer stuff too. But uh, it's it's I'm always listening to '90s hip hop because that's just the love of my life right there. And not only listening, doing shows. You know, you came down with those Neil. John O'Neill, you guys have come down to a lot of shows, and he moved away, and you stepped, you kept coming. I mean, you were die hard show attendee. Like out of all my friends, anyone I grew up with, you passed everybody. Um, the dedication that you had of coming and attending these concerts, you, and you have a full time job and a family, and you're married. And you would still be trucking down on a Wednesday night after work to see Sadat X in the Middle East upstairs. You got to get up in the morning, making <laughs> yeah. that three hour round trip, you know, get in your footage. And I was like, man, that's fucking dedication. I don't know if I had that living in Sandown. You know what I mean? Like that was, talk to me the motivation on that because that's just, that's crazy. Um, at that time, I was just trying to see everybody that like I never saw before, and, and you gave me uh, an amazing opportunity to see all these acts that I love. And um, I mean, sh- shout out to you because like I wouldn't have the opportunity that I had if it wasn't for you. And honestly, you got me on the mixtape thing too. When you were doing mixtapes way back in the day, it's like uh, you inspired me to start doing mixtapes, and, and I told you that. And- 50 mixtapes and and put movie samples in because you were doing movie samples way back in the day and uh, you you inspired me a lot and pushed me kind of like to do something different with hip-hop as well um 
So hats off to you because you've been more than a, a, like an amazing friend to me and gave me so many opportunities to see so many awesome actors, stuff like that. So uh, with me going, it was, yeah, sometimes you would have like two or three dope shows in one week and I was like, oh. like, you're killing me. Like, you're killing me. I have to go to work and I'm trying to go to all these shows. I'm like, you're absolutely killing me. Um, but yeah, I was just trying to get there. Uh, even if I had to go alone, I would go there. I, I remember. Yeah, I went, Dolo. <laughs> I remember I went to Buckshot and uh, I ran in because the traffic was fucking crazy. And you were like, dude, he just went on. You better get in there. And I was like, ran in there by myself and like watched Buckshot. And <laughs> yeah, not even Black Moon or Duck Down. He drove down for a Buckshot solo headline performance. <laughs> That's well, the type of dedication. I'm talking about it, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like he was only coming down for the big stuff. No, he was coming down for the small stuff. And I'm going to go back to that because your taste in hip-hop is super underground. Mm. Um, you know, you talk about making your mixtapes, and your mixtapes make mine look like, and I'm a pretty underground dude. You make me look commercial. And, uh, you know, you tur turned me on to all these different avenues of where to find new hip-hop because you were hitting these blogs – playing all this music from all these underground rappers, shit that wasn't even on streaming. It was just like band camp only blog, you know? Like, yeah. You were a, a fan. You're like, you know, dedicated, man. Like, talk about that. Because that, as a fellow curator, that's very time consuming, what we're talking about. Right? Yeah, definitely. Extremely. Um, yeah, it's like, a, 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 you know, a hobby of mine to just, I, I do it all the time. I, it's like, Basically, I go online and I dig in the crates and I try to find something that I haven't heard before. And, it, and you know, if something catches my eye, I give it a listen. And then if it's whack, I keep going. And if it's if dope, then I, I try to let people know about it. You know what I mean? And uh, I still do that to this day. Every day I'm online, look, search for stuff, crates and, and trying to find the next gem uh, for hip hop. Uh, the, the underground stuff is that's just what I like. I like the yeah. dirty dirty beats like <laughs> rough lyrics like uh you know it doesn't have to be rough lyrics it just they have to flow good and have you know good lyrics and yeah you know not not uh i'm not a huge like newer trap type of yeah. you know uh, i don't i'm hate not it. either i'll play i'll play i'll put you know trap artists on my list but they have to come correct on the mic you know yeah. what i mean like some some artists can come correct over a trap beat it's not mm. impossible yeah but some most don't <laughs> i'll just say that you know what i mean like yeah. most don't but if you if you come correct and you say some real shit now nah, i'm gonna fuck with it whatever the beat is as long as the beat is not like terrible yeah yeah my issue with trap is just that a lot of it sounds the same to me um i bet people that listen to trap would probably say the same about boom bap maybe but whatever um, yeah who is your favorite under what's your What's your, give me a couple on uh, some gem, uh, uh, you know, unknown artists that you like right now in the underground to see if I even know them. I well, probably I, you probably know them because I, I haven't like, uh, you I mean, you've laid back. No. Like, like ro the new, like Rome street stuff that that's come out. That that's been really good. Um, <laughs> um, my Kami I like, and no. not, like a lot of people don't like him because he had beef with West side gun and Conway for a little while. And now they're friends again and, and pray for Haiti came out and it was sure. amazing. So I never really didn't like him because he had beef with West side gun. I, I always liked him and I didn't right. give a, I didn't give a fuck what anybody said. Um, I'm trying to think like what else I've really like been listening to lately for under underground. I mean, have you heard, it's not underground, but it, did you hear that uh, Styles P Havoc? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That new a couple of joints on there, yeah, definitely. That new album is dope. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of just like things. It's fine, you can just name out any names. It's, um, you know, it, it, there's so many. That's the thing, like there's so many. For me, you know, albums, they don't like hit like they used to. Mm. It's, I'm more of like a single guy. I can take everybody in small dosages. I think most people are kind of like that. You yeah. Know, you, you know, you like things in small doses. But for me in particular, it's like hip hop. I can't even tell you the name of the last hip hop album. I was like, actually, the new Nas I like. I mean, the new Nas, Nas I think is a really good body of work. But other than that, you know, you know, last year I'd say Ari the Rugged Man had probably the dope, one of the dopest hip hop albums. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Um, 
it came out at the same night as came out the same time as West Side Gun, and everybody make a big deal about West Side Gun's album. I'm gonna say R.A. the Rubble on record. Say R.A. the Record Rugged Man's album was better than Pray for Paris, whatever the West Side Gun was. R.A.'s was really good. Uh, I think the new Russ album is pretty pretty dope. Yeah, he's got some joints on there. It was he's just he's a challenging individual. I've, I've done shows with him. He's challenging. Yeah. I also want to talk about your movie. Now, now we, we talk about your movie uh, obsession. I'm going to call it a little bit of that. Because in order to be into something too much and be on top of it, there has to be a level of obsession. Um, you're watching great independent movies every freaking goddamn night. I'm jealous because I don't have the time. I don't know how you have the time to pull that out. These are two hours. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just uh, staying up late. Like I said, I, I'm with my, um, luckily my wife works at night. So um, I get to watch like these fucked up movies, like watching and stuff like that. And I don't have to torture with watching them. Uh, my kids go to bed. And then when they go to bed, that's my hour and a half, two hours where I can hit a movie and decompress from the day and, and I work all day. And then I, you know, feed and walk the dogs and then I feed my kids and I feed and, you know, I take a shower and then by that time it's eight, nine o'clock. And um, like I said, I get two hours and then I try to just hit a movie or, or a show that I've been uh, binging lately or whatever. Um, movies, I don't know. I just have always loved movies and uh, it's just a session of mine. Are you um, an only child? I am an only child, yes. Yeah, that's what it is. I mean, uh, me too. So, like, movies was the prime source of entertainment we came in we came in you know you're you're a little, like it's a little older but you're you're the gen your vcr generation yeah so like it was easily accessible to get movies um that it wasn't for the generation before us and the generation before us you had to go to a movie theater you know not just you know it's tough you know it's the movie theater but it's like um that was my always my go-to it was my prime source of entertainment you know, mm. movies, movies, movies. Nowadays, I would, I used to be the same way. I watch one every night, but there's been a shift in the TV shows these days. Is yeah. are are much stronger than you know are are, are stronger than they were. Yeah, because I used to never watch television shows. Hated television shows. Thought they were corny. Not good stories. Watered down. Right. Yeah. But the the series, I've gotten really freaking good, man. <laughs> like, yeah. Me too, definitely. I'm watching uh, Yellow Jackets right now. It's, uh, I haven't watched that one. I, I was in, just finished Yellowstone, which I loved. I, yeah, I heard that's great. You haven't seen that? I haven't seen it yet. No. I haven't watched that one. Costner is Costner is the unsung hero of acting. <laughs> he was he's kind of like he came in really great in the '80s and stuff. He was like a big deal, you know. By yeah. like mid '90s, he kind of faded out. Everyone like hated him after Waterworld. But really, he's like steadily great always, and every the movie might be bad, he's always good. Yeah, yeah, he's good. yeah. No, I'm I'm a Costner fan definitely. Yeah, the Yellowstone is like his magnum, like I heard it's, it's, yeah. The character yeah. is great. Um, what do you see anything lately? Because you again, underground independent films. He's not watching mainstream stuff here in, in an era where it's tough to see a good movie. <laughs> you know, because yeah. of COVID. I that's that's the thing like about underground hip hop and in movies like independent movies uh, i'm always digging i've seen so many things like i'll look at netflix and amazon prime and hulu and i'm like i've seen all these fucking movies like there's nothing that i haven't seen so i'm always digging for something that's quality i don't want to watch like some shit shit movie that has right. bad just horrible effects or whatever it is um so i'm always searching for like the good movie that's going to you know, grasp me. And um, the last couple movies I've watched, I watched the new Venom movie, which was fucking horrible. Um, that sucks because Tom Hardy's great. Oh, Tom Hardy's great. And that movie is uh, like the first one I like. And the second one is a fucking joke. Um, Red Rocket, I watched with uh, Simon that looks, <laughs> that was I've, done a few, I've done a few Simon Rex shows. I thought, I thought uh, yeah, Dirt Nasty, right? Dirt Nasty, I've done a few. He's quite yeah. the character. Yeah, uh, I thought Red Rocket was good. I thought yeah, it was good. it's funny. What, what I think is very important about indie films, and people don't understand it, because I was into indie films early, and like my boys, like Parker and all these other guys, like, what are you watching? Shut up, Kane. Kane was down. Like, what are you watching? Because I had sophisticated tastes as a young person because yeah. my mother watched hardcore dramas early, um, so I would watch these movies with her, like all these crazy movies um, as young, and really appreciated good story, you know. 
Whereas yeah. like mainstream movies, you're going to get a real basic mainstream story. You're not going to get a great, you're going to get a real basic to the masses story. Whereas the yeah. indie films nowadays have the great, the better interesting original stories that you can't necessarily broadcast to a mainstream audience. So that's what you get. You get a little more darkness with that because mainstream movies can't always be that dark. So, you know, it's like yeah, you're going to yeah. get a little more dark reality hardcore drama with something that's more real with an indie film than you would with a mainstream Ghostbusters or something like that, yeah. you know? Because you see enough mainstream movies, you keep seeing the same story over and over again. And there's something about newer movies and big commercial movies that because it's so big and commercial and the production is so over the top, it doesn't feel real. Yeah. So it, to me, it doesn't connect. Um, and I think it's the same thing with underground music too. It's it, Versus mainstream, it's like, it's more real. I can relate to more of that than I can relate to a bunch of rich mother motherfuckers talking about all the crazy shit that, you know, they don't or do have. Yeah. I, I don't, that's not my world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's not my struggle, but that's the art in the art that comes out of that is the best. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. I'm like you. I, I heard you say on an interview before that you don't, uh, you don't fuck with comedies that much. I can't stand comedies. Like, like I like a good one, but they're terrible plots. <laughs> yeah, they're terrible plots, and they stretch it out for two hours, and the, and then a comedy turns into a serious movie for like the last fifteen minutes, and, and it's dark almost, comedy. Like I like a dark comedy. Yeah, like something I, that's kind of like a drama that has yeah, some humor in it. That's usually that, that's yeah, yeah, but a straight up like com comedy like Ted or something like. <laughs> I fucking hate that shit. Hot tub time machine. <laughs> My boy's always like, you watch, you watch sick, twisted, dark, fucking terrible movies. I'm like, what are you watching? Hot tub time machine. Like, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty funny, man. I'm like, no, it's not at all. Yeah, it's I can't. Funny enough. I can't watch shit like that. I just can't watch comedies. I like like the old school comedies, like Eddie Murphy. You know. Uh, yeah, it's funny because Eddie Murphy. It's not funny because the movie's good. I mean, you yeah. take Eddie Murphy out of the movie and put someone else in there, but the movie's horrible. Yeah, it's <laughs> well, like Bachelor Party with Tom Hanks. That's like that's that, a good one, but that's only because it's a classic. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I can get with the, down with the classics, but nowadays I just can't fuck with comedy, so I just can't do it. Just not my comedies was 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 really good. Like I watched Stripes the other day with Bill Murray. So you good, Candy. So good. Because it's Bill Murray, you know what I mean? You need, like, if you don't have a comedy, you need someone that can really nail it. Because other yeah. than that, it's going to tank. Like Sandler, man. Sandler was great at first, but, man, it's like some yeah, of these he, movies are such strikeouts. Man. Will Ferrell, such strikeouts, man. Yeah. Early stuff is amazing. Yeah. That, once they got, you know, it just couldn't couldn't do it. Now, I know you got to go, so I'm going to wrap up. I want to talk about your podcast real quick. Um Talk to me about your podcast. You did it with hardcore. Like, what was the point of your heart your uh, podcast? Uh, well, I mean, during like the beginning of the pandemic, I was kind of bored. I was just like sitting at home all the time, like not really doing much. Um, so uh, I watched a few other people, like my friend Ron from Pittsburgh was doing doing it kind of like at a small scale, and um, he kind of gave me the inspiration to because I know a lot of people from the scene and stuff like that, and and. I, you know, they're really important to me to talk to them because those type of musicians that I'm talking up to don't really get that shine. And maybe it gets the younger kids to go listen to older music or I listen to, I mean, I've talked to younger kids too that are fans now too. Um, so I like to mix it up with new and old, but uh, the thought process was just that, um, you know, I was bored and I wanted to expose these bands that hadn't been talked about for a while. So I just started talking to like reaching out and being like, Hey, you want to talk to me about, you know, how your band began began and, and what were you listening to before you found hardcore and stuff like that. And uh, it's just been really, really good. And I've got a lot of friends out of doing this and it was a learning process doing it at first because I was a real greenhorn. Like I was stuttering and saying, um, a hundred yeah. times. And, I still do. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I do it too. But um is tough. For those that don't know, doing interviews, um is a tough one to kick. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough one. Super tough. So hard. It's like, I listen to me, I listen to my interviews going back, and I'm just like, I like hear every um is like, oh, fuck. 
Yeah, and it's almost impossible to stop too. Um, hey, you just said it. Yeah, because so. you yeah. have a thought, and you're like you're thinking, and you just kind of you're talking, you're thinking, and the um is like the pause. I'd rather I'd rather say um than like though. <laughs> yeah, feel you. But you seem to be doing well with the podcast. It seems like people are really kind of into it, and it, it's good that you can touch on this piece of culture that we kind of touched on earlier. The hardcore scene, these people. Where are they now? What was it like? Trade stories. Because, you know, it is a big subculture of music. And for someone who worked in it, like me, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's powerful. It's a powerful movement, man. Yeah. And, and like I said, not a lot of people are interviewing the people that I'm interviewing. So um, I, I don't even like to say interview. It was, it's more of a discussion for me because I kind of try to, right. me and you are like two friends shooting the shit, kind of right. have it flow organically um, and that's where it goes. And and I, I think that's I think that's the appeal of these things, versus just a straight up interview where it's like, you know, where I'm just like, how was your childhood? You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's like I think people want to see people in the natural state talking, um, and just kind of hear these stories and hear people and just it makes them it, it feels more real, feel more connected, feels mm -hmm. like you know me better or I know you better. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. I think that's what people really, that's the appeal of these, you know, that's, that's the appeal. I think the face to face is, is very important too. You could do a podcast and, and, you know, you're not looking at the person's facial expressions and stuff right. like that. Um, yeah. It, it's just, I like the face to face. I like the, the closeness of it. I, I just, I'm really digging like it. And I, and I'm planning on only doing maybe 102, two of them got lost. Instagram fuck my, two of them up completely. I couldn't save them. Uh, Fuck. I'm going to do a hundred on YouTube and then uh, I don't know. I'll probably try to go into something else. I have a, uh, since Instagram fucked me and um, I was banned for an hour, they're giving me an hour and uh, a minute and 20 seconds left for me and you. So. Oh, well, then we better wrap this up. Email me this please so I can upload it. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast brought to you by Chubby Chickpea with hip hop and hardcore enthusiast Hal Capone. Brother, I will talk to you soon. It's been great catching up with you, man, and hope you and your family stay safe. You too. Don't catch that COVID. I know it's swirling around your house right Every, now. Everyone in my house got it but me. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> years, that... of working at, years of working in a dirty nightclub made <laughs> Yeah, you. No, definitely. I'm surprised you didn't either. Uh, thank you for uh, reaching out. This was time, brother. And then happy, you know, you just celebrate 50 years again, 50 years on this earth, and uh, happy birthday to that, too. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. All right, man. All right. Let up. Peace.